Hello. This is another one of my videos on my long essay, Sociological Theories, regarding the emergence and development of new religious movements. This one dealing quite briefly with secularization and modernization. So we've already discussed psychological theories regarding the emergence of new religious movements, in particular ideas about deprivation. Uh, I then moved on to talk about crisis theories and discussed ideas of crises of survival, social potency, and of meaning and psychic fulfillment. Uh, and then after that, we moved on to talk about ideological contexts. And I'm going to talk about two of those uh, today secularization and modernization, and then in the next two videos on plausibility and millenarianism. In the last video, I talked about changes in plausibility structures experienced by small localized societies when they're subordinated by larger, more complex ones. So now let's uh, go on from there. Even more far-reaching processes have been identified, uh, however, uh, most notably those stemming from Max Weber's account of the modern world. In terms of religious change, the most important of these putative processes is that of secularization, a term with a variety of meanings, some of them heavily ideological in nature. In the strongest version of the secularization thesis, cogently argued by Brian Wilson, uh, the spread of secular rationality and the ethos of impersonal calculation underlying modern industrial, urban and bureaucratic structures were such as to cause a general and almost total decline in religious beliefs, practices and institutions. Where religion survived, it was only on the very margins of modern society, in contexts bearing no significance for the central functioning of society. Without denying that being religious may in some sense be marginal to the main thrust of modern life, such an all-encompassing view of secularization cannot be justified, however. Not only is the putative pre-modern age of faith revealed on closer inspection not to have existed, and tribal societies found to contain all of the varieties of skepticism and materialism, as well as of spiritual fervor, but even modern supposedly secularized countries are revealed to vary greatly in the nature and importance of their religious beliefs and institutions. A more restrictive view of secularization is tenable, however, if this term is confined to something like its original legal meaning. Thus, for Bergwood Luckman, secularization implied little more than the process of demonopolization, by which a previously dominant religious institution lost its religious monopoly together with the progressive disengagement of society from religious control, as religious authorities lost their traditional political, economic, educational and social welfare roles. Unlike the more wide-ranging conceptions of secularization, such developments lend themselves comparatively easily to historical study, whatever the evaluative charge placed upon them. The structural consequence of this demonopolization of religion could be quite profound, for when the state no longer served as a religious enforcement agency, but rather as a relatively impartial guardian of order between independent and uncoerced religious competitors, a market situation of pluralism and choice emerged, not only as between different religious groups, but between, but between religious and secular ideologies, a more basically in the simple right to contract out of established religion. Faced with this situation, religious groups were liable to become more responsive to market demand and cost effectiveness, engaging in mergers and oligopolistic uh, market management, much as secular companies might. Indeed, as Anderson has pointed out, the tendency towards the oligopolistic division of the religious market paralleled the rise to dominance of oligopolistic capitalism. 
I'm sorry, having used the same word three times, it's rather hard. Um, the sects which arose in opposition to such developments coming to perform the useful role of fulfilling the gaps in the religious market, for example, evangelizing the poor, left as unprofitable by the oligopolistic denominations. Beyond uh, these structural effects, according to Berger and Luckman, demonopolization and pluralism also carry profound implications for the transformation of consciousness, but these are less ine inexorable than those postulated by the secularization theorists. The fullest statement of these implications by Berger and his associates in their account of modernization, in part of the working of the re is in their account of modernization, in part of the working of the Weberian saga of the rationalization of the world. According to this view, the uh, process of modernization comprised the institutional concomitant of technologically induced economic growth, that is, the techno technologized economy, the modern bureaucratic state, the contemporary city, and social cultural pluralism, the last of which in particular bore profound consequences for social consciousness in its erosion of traditional certainties of all kinds. Thus, amongst the conditionally religious, the prevalence of pluralism and of secular worldviews exerted cognitive pressures, which led to either an abandonment of religious beliefs and practices, a secularization of the religious tradition itself, a defensive reinforcement of tradition, or the fragile endeavor to reroute faith in human religious experience. Uh, this is also a theme uh, covered in Berger's book, Heretical Imperative, on which I've made a number of videos, which I'll give the reference to below. Whilst less fatalistic than Weber, as to the effects of rationalization and modernization, the Bulgarian view is still inclined towards an overall pessimism as to the possibility of human action in stemming the resultant alienation or homelessness of human consciousness. Movements of counter-modernization or demodernization, some of them religious in nature, had at various times appeared, but these were invariably fated to be driven to the margins of modern society by the institutional strength and expansive imperatives of modernization. So I'll end there for the moment. Thank you very much for listening and particular thanks to my patrons for their kind support and encouragement, without which I wouldn't be able to make these videos. As always, uh, you're very welcome to support my channel. Do like, comment and share if you will. Um, subscribe if you want to be notified of future videos. Click the bell button. Uh, I'll give Patreon and PayPal links below in case you want to provide practical support. Next week, we'll talk about plausibility and millenarianism. Uh, as usual, my apologies for not including the uh, references to the various authors I've cited. Uh, my papers are still all boxed away, so I can't access them uh, for the bibliography for this essay. Uh, have a good day.